one of my particular areas of focus is, is this uh, relatively common cancer in, in childhood called neuroblastoma. Um, it's a fascinating cancer from a, a research standpoint, but it can be very devastating for families, obviously. Um, its cause is lar largely unknown. It, it originates from neural crest or nervous system tissues, and it's the second most common solid tumor in children. Um, it has a highly variable clinical outcome, and this is sort of what drew me to the field uh, to begin with. This is, on the left, a picture of a, a young baby whose liver and spleen is massively infiltrated by tumor. Um, and presented within the first few months of life with neuroblastoma. But we know this particular kind of disease can actually spontaneously regress without any treatment. So this baby was watched, and a few months later, this is the appearance of the baby without any cancer chemotherapy. Hmm. <clears throat> As opposed to this uh, young lady, unfortunately, who presented a little bit older at three years of age, she has sort of dark circles around her eyes. That's from actually metastatic involvement of the bones around her orbit, and she's quite ill. So the rest of her body is also massively infiltrated with tumors. And despite very, very aggressive therapy, over half of these children die from this type of cancer. So we're very interested at, in figuring out, um, we know that some children die and some children are cured of this cancer. We're trying to figure out genetic mechanisms to understand how some children are able to respond to this therapy. Or on the flip side, why some children fail this therapy. Oh, and I'm sorry. Um, so we have algorithms to predict um, patients' risk of relapse, whether their tumor will come back or not. But we really don't have accurate measures to identify those patients who will respond to treatment and eventually be cured. So we know up front who needs the most aggressive therapy, but we don't know after treatment who's going to survive and who will have a relapse and eventually die. So the, the way that we're going about this is to use genetics to try and determine patients who will and won't respond to, to treatment. And the, our specific aim is to look at genetic factors that are associated with chemotherapy resistance and to see if those factors play a role in treatment failure. So we have a, a model, if you will, of chemotherapy resistance in the lab in test tubes where we expose white blood cells from healthy volunteers to chemotherapy. And um, one of the main side effects of these chemotherapies we use is a lowering of the white blood cell count. So we can use um, healthy white blood cells and you track their rate of death and use that as sort of a proxy of response or non-response to chemotherapy. So fast dying white blood cells are compared to very slow, slowly dying white blood cells and their genetic factors are um, compare to see what factors are associated with resistance in that model. We then come up with a list of, say, hundreds of these SNPs that Dr. Pierce talked about, and we look at those SNPs in uh, actual patients with neuroblastoma. So we have a database of over a thousand children with the highest risk form of neuroblastoma that we can only cure about 50% <clears> of, and we're testing <throat> those individual factors in our clinical model. Uh, and we're hoping to then gain insights into the biology of treatment failure and to hopefully come up with better and more effective treatment strategies or to recognize patients up front who are at highest risk for failure and to modify their therapy accordingly. So this is just one quick example. Um, so this uh, letter and number combination is just a barcode for one genetic variant that was associated in our cell model with resistance to one specific chemotherapy, cyclophosphamide. So the function of this uh, single nucleotide variant seems to be associated with the expression of this gene, which is called caspase-1. So uh, single nucleotide polymorphism means you can either have an A mark or a G mark in your DNA. And patients that have two G marks seem to have the highest expression of this gene. And we know the SNP was associated with chemotherapy resistance in our model and was also associated with poor outcome in our patients. And so because we're assigning a function now to this variant, it seems to regulate the expression of this gene. And in fact, in our cell model, when we knock down the caspase one gene and expose the cells to chemotherapy, we're actually showing this orange line shows that we're making the cells more sensitive to chemotherapy. So, for instance, strategies to modulate caspase-1 in patients may be an effective mechanism to increase sensitivity to chemotherapy and hopefully improve cure rates. 
So that's just a, a brief example of what we're doing. We're sort of repeating these models or these experiments in tumor cells because we're doing it all in healthy cells right now. We want to make sure it works in cancer cells. But this is sort of what we envision as the promise of these types of studies. So thank you very much.